Dr. Clifton. Hi, everybody. Go ahead and, Doc, you can call the order if you want. Oh, sure. And we are, um, <laughs> we're still missing, by the way, the, the other doctor, Dr. Levine, but um, I don't think we're, should be expecting him today. Yeah, I don't think we're expecting him today, so I am going to start the recording. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, we'll call the meeting to order. Can I think someone has to second that. Is that right? No, just or go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> we have to approve the minutes, and somebody right. has to second that. Right. And okay. Meg, Meg uh, Dealey, she, she didn't receive those, so I think we're just sending those to her. Yep, okay. I just got them from Jim. Thanks. I'm oh, sorry about that, Meg. No worries. I probably have an email in my inbox from a different bank. Is that <laughs> why are these on my desk? I don't uh, recognize the folks in the uh, in the in the Vermont office, or what I presume to be the Vermont office. Sure. Well, why, why don't we take roll first, and then uh, Bryn will be able to tell you who's in that room. Okay. All right, I can do that. Um, so, uh, Dr. Clifton is here, Meg Delia, Jim Romanoff, all present. And we also have Bryn uh, Hare, and it looks like uh, Sharon James Pepper. And then Bryn, could you tell us who else is in the, in the room? Sure, we have four members of the public, and we also have Melissa Anderson from DPS. Great, thank you. Oh, marvelous. So we'll have some time for public commentary after. And then, Doctor, if you want to, um, you want to get approval for the minutes? Oh, sure. Can I get a approval for the minutes? Uh, oh, someone? Yeah, I'm someone. And I think Meg's still reviewed. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve. I, I reviewed them. Jim, I don't know if you've had a chance or had any comments on them. I think you're muted, Jim. Am I allowed to second? I'll second it. Oh. Second. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Those are approved. Do you want to proceed with the agenda, Dr. Clifton? All right, sure. Thank you so much. I think, uh, let's see, I'm pulling up the um, agenda now. I feel like uh, we've really moved along beautifully here, and uh, and we probably can, uh, you know, we may even be able to make this our uh, last meeting unless something comes up today. Oh shoot, I just uh, pulled up the minutes rather than the agenda. Let me see if I can uh, get the agenda pulled up. Okay, yeah. So for today, we wanted to review maybe the um, uh, and, and and potentially finalize the uh, possession caregivers and home growth and do some assigning tasks and and of course public comment so um, so I wanted to get cooking then uh, specifically on possession and just as a review we were talking at our past meeting about the uh, about the possession um, issue being uh, you know somewhat tied in with any possession issues that can come up from uh, um, from um, recreational uh, in terms of amount that uh, that people are allowed to uh, carry, uh, but we also worry that in some cases with uh, medicinal patients, they would have uh, they would pick up a 90 day supply at a time, uh, in which case they might have to have uh, uh, have the opportunity to have a higher level of possession, and then we also of course have to make room for medicinal patients who are using concentrates like RSOs or DABs or something. So I just wanted to make sure that the subcommittee felt comfortable with possession limits that were consistent with a 90-day supply recommendation, uh, either by the patient's pharmacist or doctor or a care provider, um, and, and have that be our subcommittee recommendation. I would not agree with that. I think that's putting more onus on some sort of healthcare professional to determine what a patient needs, um, which is more involvement than physicians or care providers that really have the date. Um, I am still in support of aligning with adult use uh, possession limits. 
And I would agree. I mean, uh, the uh, Central Mobile Oversight Committee had recommended an increase to three ounces in a 30 day period, uh, which really isn't exactly possession, but it was purchase of three ounce, ounces of uh, medical cannabis in a 30 day period. And then in terms of uh, going forward, I think we would say the same thing to, to make sure that it is pegged to at least adult use so that medical patients are uh, penalized if, if for less uh, if they're carrying too much, but potentially more. But I would agree that it's putting the onus on <clears throat> health care providers to decide that the amount won't is going to be going a lot further than we are now. Okay. Um, I mean, my concern is that a patient might need more than three ounces, you know, and might be, you know, um, that and might find themselves transporting more than three ounces if they go to purchase a, a 90 day supply at a time. And then if they have four ounces and they're using it medically, they could be in a sticky situation. You know, that's, uh, that's where I'm worried about the alignment uh, with recreational. I mean, Jim, what do you think about that? Or Megan, what do you think about that? I just am not sure how many patients, how many ounces the average patient is using, and if we're only at three ounces, are we covering for patients who are using concentrates at higher amounts, or like seizure patients, people that are using larger amounts? The, the current law is has it at two ounces per 30-day period, and concentrates are considered at their actual weight after manufacturing as that amount of medical cannabis. So if it's one gram of concentrate, it's only one gram of medical cannabis. So that's really not an issue under the current laws. And we had proposed an increase to three ounces, which the, the prevailing opinion was that would cover, for the most part, uh, most patients. Will it cover all? I, I, I'm sure somebody Will not be covered and be left out, but I think the risk to, you know, uh, having a situation where medical providers would be pushed way beyond where they're at now, uh, balance with an increase to three ounces would be good, maybe not perfect, but better than uh, putting it all in the hands of the medical providers. Oh no, I was I was thinking about maybe some verbiage. Would it make sense to have verbiage of three ounces or? Uh, an amount that a medical or, or that, that could be overridden by a medical provider or a treating pharmacist if you know the patient required higher amounts. So currently pharmacists are not um, involved in the program at all in that sense. Um, so I think we can kind of just do away with that component. As far as a healthcare provider maybe signing a waiver saying a patient needs more, um, I think it's hard to really form an opinion based on that when we don't know what the adult use possession limits will look like. You know, are, are people going to be able to walk into an adult use dispensary and purchase an ounce at a time uh, as frequently as they would like? Or um, is that going to be limited to maybe three times a month? Whatever it may be, because we don't know that, I think it's difficult to say, okay, we want to align with the adult use possession limits but here's a workaround for people who need more. Um, since we don't know what those limits are, I think three ounces uh, could be a good minimum. You know, patients are allowed at least that, and then if adult use allows for more, um, then looking to those adult use recommendations. But um, ultimately, I think providers are not as involved um, with the actual purchasing process as much as they are just verifying. Okay, okay. I just don't want to put any Vermont patient in a position where they're, you know, transporting some product and they're getting in trouble, you know, getting pulled over and getting in trouble because they have a little bit more than they should have, especially for people who are high consumers. So I'm just trying to think of a way to make that as safe as possible for those medical, uh, for those medical uh, patients. Okay. 
All right, then we can uh, make a recommendation of three ounces uh, uh, as a as a as a uh, possession. But then in the home, we have talked about really no limits on the amount of possession in the home. Uh, but but in terms of transporting back and forth, a limit of three ounces. And then I think the only other things you guys that we had thought about was caregivers. We were worried about how many people a, care, a caregiver should be um, allowed to see uh, as, as a caregiver. And different states have different recommendations. They are varying anywhere from 1 to 15. I feel like following in Vermont's, you know, um, sort of the way that I perceive the state of Vermont as being, you know, small farms and small businesses and uh, and, and neighbors helping neighbors. I, I, I think that a larger number of, of people per caregiver would probably be valuable and consistent with state goals and ideals. Um, I, what is everybody else? Then? Well, this is just the, the <coughs> as I mentioned last week, I think the caregiver situation, you know, we just need to be careful about the definitions. Right now, uh, as it's defined, and I don't have it exactly, but as it's defined in the medical cannabis law, uh, patients allowed only one caregiver. And that we have tried to correct because it is uh, uh, unreasonable just from a practical point of view, you know, somebody needs 24 hours care, They're, they might have two caregivers, and both of those caregivers might be the ones that need to uh, handle, carry, or, or, or pick up or purchase the uh, medical cannabis. And right now, the patients are only allowed to assign one. But the issue in other states, and, and I'm afraid here, is often a little mixed up because the term caregiver is also used to apply to growers who are growing for patients. So I don't think that's necessarily a bad idea. Growers, small growers growing for a patient, but calling them caregivers and including it under those you know, uh, laws just seems confusing and silly. So you know, going forward, the recommendation from uh, the Oversight Committee had been to increase the number of caregivers uh, for patients uh, because practically speaking it was necessary, medically speaking it might be, uh, but also uh, the definition to be, uh, it, it has been under some debate, but, but having it include growers would probably not, not be the direction. I would agree. I think when you start going down that path where you have one person growing for a number of medical patients, it um, then introduces, okay, well, at what point should we be getting some lab testing done? Um, where are there kind of these safety elements that we have um, required at the dispensaries that if uh, a small grower is growing for multiple patients, you know, why aren't they subject to that? Um, and so I would agree that the definition does need to be reviewed um, and that the, it should be made clear kind of that separation, as Jim was alluding to. Yeah. And, and I definitely am not saying that that small growers should definitely you know, not be growing for patients. I, I agree with Meg. There's all issues of testing and what standards things are going to be done to. But it's really just a matter of separating the language so it's not confusing. Uh, you know, a, a, a grower would be a grower. Caregivers are taking care of somebody medically speaking and so might handle their their and need to, okay. so it might need to be more than one. Okay, so a grower might be somebody who is doing a, a, I mean, we would just define them as a small private grower, and then a caregiver would be somebody more of like a coach that would help to, to assist. Uh, you know, th that's what I believe the, the definition, the, the medical practitioners on our oversight committee, you know, have expressed their desire for caretakers, you know, to be defined in that, you know, more medically uh, and healthcare accepted way of uh, taking care of medical health care needs as an aide or a nurse might do, and administering or carrying the medication might be necessary. More than one caregiver might be necessary for the patient, but the idea, you know, the 
main law keeps getting brought up, people are enthusiastic about it. And I would just say, you know, suggest addressing it and labeling it in a different way. And under, you know, licensing for growers, can a grower grow for one, one uh, medical patient? Uh, but not confuse it with the idea of a caregiver. Someone so, can end up, you know, without somebody to uh, take care of it. So really, there's no reason to limit caregivers at all. I mean, if somebody wants to be a caregiver, why couldn't they take care of 15 people a day? I, you know, I, I, that's not for me to determine. I'm not a professional uh, in the area of, of caregivers, but I think the question really is whether each caregiver, you know, is a person who can grow for a patient. And I know that's an or eager to address, perhaps through the term caregiver, uh, because individuals can grow at home, so a caregiver should be able to do it at home for a patient as well. But maybe they become a grower, and it's a different thing. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, do, we want, do we want to differentiate caregivers from growers, and then talk more about home grow and and uh, and. Is, do we want to do that, or do we want to talk about caregivers as small growers? I'm sorry, I've interrupted you, Megan. No, I'll let Jim answer, and then go ahead. Well, I think that you know the, the way that we've talked about it on the oversight committee, we should be using the language of caregiver to to reflect uh, an aid or somebody taking care of a person's self care needs, and handling the medication might be necessary. Growing it for one person spreads it into a different area. And I think that's what people keep bringing up with the main law where a caregiver it can be a grower and it's just confusing. So I would suggest, I, I think the idea of a grower being able to grow for a small group of patients or one patient is, is an appropriate idea. I just think it, it shouldn't be bound together with the term caregiver. So I would say yes, address it separately, you know, uh, under how licensing is done for growers uh, so that they can grow for an individual. Yeah, so I, I understand that. So I, I think we're in agreement that we need to make a distinction between caregiver and grower. But what, what I don't understand is because there will be different tiers of, of cultivators and, and cultivator licenses. And one of the terms of art within the licensing will be kind of small cultivator, right? Um, that's not what you're discussing here, or will be enveloped under that. But also, I mean, there, there's a separate product safety committee, and, and testing was going to be mandated um, for all those levels of, of licensing. Are, are you proposing kind of a different tier? of licensing for small growers that just serve medical patients? No, I, I think what I'm saying is you would include in those small cultivators the ability for them to grow for a medical patient with the appropriate testing you know, uh, and guidelines, but uh, just as they would grow for another small client. And I don't think you need a different cultivator uh, necessarily. It, it, uh, I agree. A small cultivator can grow for whoever the, the consumer is, including the medical patients. I, I don't know if you may need to make any distinction at all on that end, right? Well, right now, caretakers are allowed to grow for a patient. And I think the question is going to be, as any individual is allowed to grow, and I could grow in, for an adult in my house under the law, you know, I can do the work. And so, you know, I think the question is, is when when we talked earlier about home grow, I'm supportive of the idea of patients growing their own medicine and and I and being connected to it. And yet I believe it's very difficult. A patient who has a disability is in many ways could be very unlikely to be able to handle the physical burden of growing four gigantic seven foot plants outdoors or you know big plants inside and it is risky they can die all those things i've mentioned but the idea of having a grower 
grow a specific strain or variety for you or makes sense to me. And where it gets confusing is right now, a caretaker can grow for a patient. And there's a question of the language of a patient only being able to have one caretaker. And if it were a medical caretaker and a healthcare caretaker, not a grower, you would not say that about somebody you wanted to take care of. You would say they might need two hair, you know, depending on their, their needs, they might be round the clock caretakers. So I'm saying split it apart and, and a, a patient can specify another person to grow for them, hopefully a, a cultivator. Or an adult who's got the, you know, isn't already growing for themselves and has the legal right to grow. My, Is that my clear? Thoughts. Go ahead, Megan, I'm sorry. My concern with um, kind of separating these definitions of caregiver is that it, although there are definitely a number of caregivers who are, as Jim is alluding to, the medical caregivers, there are also a number of caregivers who are a patient's spouse. So I, I am a little weary of completely changing that definition because I think for a lot of the patients and caregivers we see, they want it to remain fairly simple, which is they designate their spouse a caregiver, their spouse can grow cannabis for them as a medical patient. Um, so I think if we kind of get into tweaking this definition of a caregiver, we do run the risk of um, kind of taking away that simplicity for so many of the people who are using it just like that. Um, and I, you know, I do worry that if medical patients could go to a small craft grower and designate them as a grower, that it's um, it, it, it's just diluting further the patient population. Um, that, you know, currently we've discussed all of these barriers to access to increase uh, participation in the program. And I do worry, you know, we saw when home grow was added a couple of years ago, we saw a drastic decline in the program. So I do worry that, um, if we kind of expand the home grow options in that sense, you know, let a patient go to a small craft grower, that we're only going to further dilute the program and then essentially be back to square one because we don't have enough support for the dispensaries. I'm worried about these patients that, you know, that just don't have the money and you know, where dispensaries are, are, are really just not an option for them because of the, because of the much higher cost compared to compared to doing your own home grow. I mean, I'm, I'm worried about, uh, I'm worried about any negative impacts on home grow because I feel like in the cases of so many people with disabilities, you know, I mean, medical, uh, medical bills are the number one reason for bankruptcy in this country. So there, a lot of these people are really struggling already. And, uh, and if we hamper home grow, you know, then we may take a patient who, let's just say, you know, designated their wife, their wife is only allowed to grow for one patient, they have, uh, you know, three, they're allowed three plants uh, uh, that, that are able to go to maturity, they've got two growth cycles, uh, and then that'll give them enough medicine, but one of their plants gets a fungus, you know, then they're, then they don't have enough, you know, medicine. And they don't really have an option of going and getting insurance covered product from from a dispensary or they don't have the money for a dispensary you know um for i mean from a disabled from a disabled point of patient point of view with limited resources i'm really worried about limitations on home grow i, I just want to quickly add in i, I don't disagree that a, a, a parent a husband a wife should also be able to be a caretaker in that same way and, and I think what I'm what the intention of what I'm saying is to not have the term caretaker you know sort of diverted into really being about how many patients a person can grow for you know I would even say if we want caretakers to be able to grow let's use that term and say they can grow for more people it's just confusing uh, and, a, and people use it as a workaround. And, I'm, and so I'm for growers growing for a patient, and I'm, I'm for four people, you know, and I believe the Oversight Committee uh, it has discussed this in a few ways for, you know, uh, 
able to have a caretaker, at least the term, not be as confusing. Now, that being said, I, I have to say I really disagree with the, the premise on the home grow that it's necessarily cheaper or a better idea. It's not. I do it here. We don't have two grow cycles. We have three quarters of a grow cycle. And if you're like my house, I don't have sun in the backyard. If I didn't work here, I couldn't move the plants on expensive wheels all day long to get enough sun to grow enough product. So I think it's, I support the idea, you know, that I agree with you that we, we have to support and preserve home grow as an option, but it, it is more realistic to think that, and I understand Meg's point of view about having growers diluting, you know, who is providing the medical product, but that makes more sense to me than thinking that uh, somebody with a disability, most of the people I know, or many of them using medical cannabis, would have a difficult time moving the plants, would have a handling it. It's just not, I don't think, realistic. Yeah, I would agree. I, I, I have to say that I don't necessarily feel that the home grow option is automatically the less expensive. I also think if you want prices of the dispensaries to decrease, they, you know, there just simply needs to be more participation in the program. And I think it's the dispensary's hope that when adult use rolls out and they can purchase from small craft growers, they'll have a broader selection of products um, as well as lower prices because they are, um, you know, they are given that opportunity to also uh, participate in adult use. Yeah. I, I... Correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, some of this is academic, right? We're not, no one's saying take away or reduce the home girl option. No one is. That, that's already there. So I, I don't think we need That is there. Yeah, I don't think we deal with that. Well, what, just to bring this back to focus, what, what we need to take care of is the fact that it can't be one-on-one -on -one for caretakers, and, and we can eliminate that as, as the recommendation, correct? I guess I, I would be curious to hear your thoughts on why it can't remain a one-on-one. -on -one. Well, I, I think I think Jim expressed those. I'll, I'll, I'll try and summarize it unless Jim, you want to... Well, I'm not sure that I'm, you know, I, I'm not saying it can't be one-on-one. -on -one. What I've, I'm right. concerned about is the push to move in a direction as many great ideas as there are in Maine, the idea of a grower collective bargaining with a, a group of patients doesn't seem like the way the Vermont Medical Cannabis Program has worked and doesn't contain the kind of controls uh, that we would look for, I, I don't think. So that's what I'm trying to avoid. The, the term caregiver, you know, being confused with uh, lots of growers and there's a, a push to have multiple caregivers because you might need more than one person besides growing cannabis to take care of a, of a patient for anything and so you know you just need to clean up that term if caregiver is just the term being used for a grower we should call them the designated grower or something maybe and they could be in the family, they could be somebody else, you know. And then I think the question of the reverse of caregivers all of a sudden being people who can grow for five people, it, you know, it isn't a definition under the medical program, but it's a cultivator definition. And I wonder if there's an economy of scale if we may, if we have a concept that a caregiver can be a caregiver to 15 people and they're good at growing uh, cannabis, then they could have a home grow that could potentially aid in the support of, you know, 15 people rather than just uh, one person, you know, is there, is there, that's where I'm trying to, that's where I'm trying to get to the same place, Jim. Excuse me, one minute, there's someone's hand up in the room for about a minute or so now. Thank oh, you. Sorry. And so, um, we have Lindsay Wells here is in the room and she'd like to make a comment. Um, I was wondering what would happen to those caregivers of loved ones like the husband caring for his wife with cancer or the mother of the child with seizures. 
because a lot of our caregivers, I would say the vast majority, 90% of them are not growing for yeah. a patient, they're caring for their loved one. It's almost like it's two different categories in a way. Um, not that I would want to prevent a mother or a spouse from growing, but um, the, there's definitely there are two different concepts and I just haven't heard you talk about when you speak about caregivers about the mother with the infant with seizures or the husband with the wife going through chemo. Yeah, I would agree with Lindsay here that the majority of these caregivers are just as she described. And so, you know, this notion that maybe one person could grow for 15, I think that's exactly what Jim was saying. We don't want to go towards that sounds a lot like the main model. And we've both stated that we do not agree with that model for Vermont at current. Um, unless, Jim, I don't know if I... No, I, I agree. I agree with what you're saying. Like, and I agree and, and want to confirm, I agree with what Lindsay's saying. But, you know, that as I corrected myself before, a caregiver, you know, who is taking care of a spouse or a child with epilepsy or cancer or something, you know, the definition of caregiver for the medical, for growers, shouldn't get in the way of that. Those are the people taking care of their loved ones. And might they be the person that's the grower? Yes. but. That doesn't mean we need to define a person who's a caregiver in a professional way. They might be a grower too, and I think their desire is to say, well, I can grow for five people the same way I can take care of five people. But that gets under cultivation, and we should just leave it, let cultivation licensing take care of that. Perhaps for the sake of simplicity, we leave the caregiver uh, definition as is and add in an additional caregiver like um, an additional caregiver option but that is not to grow as Jim said maybe it's a medical caregiver maybe it's a second parent who's administering the medication um, you know I think that's something that we would definitely feel comfortable with but adding um, expanding how many patients a caregiver can grow for I don't think um, is the right route at least that's not what I'm hearing. It should be reflected in the cultivator clause that they can grow for patients. It just confuses what a caregiver is. Okay. Tom, do you feel like uh, like we have enough data to write a recommendation from the subcommittee based on based on this on this discussion? Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. What, what a, and I guess I need a clarity on what Meg just said. Meg, you're not against expanding one-on-one -on -one caregivers as long as it's for medical professional purposes. Yeah, because I think Jim is correct. You, you know, if you have 24-7 uh, care, it, it's unlikely that one person is doing that all the time. Right. And so I think it makes sense to add a second medical caregiver. Um, right. That might be apparent. Yeah, it might be a parent, it could be a, sure. you know, child, Guardian. it could be anyone. Um, yeah, so, but to do so specifically um, as a caretaker and not somebody who can also grow for that patient, I think one grower is fine. Okay, yeah, I, I, I understand now. And I would just add to that that it would be great for it to be addressed under licensing how small growers can grow for patients. It just and I understand Meg's point of view on that, and I know what I'm saying is different. It's just I don't think it should be addressed here. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. Um, yeah. Okay, okay. I think that probably leads us to our final discussion about home grow and where we should, uh, where we should uh, place that. Wait. I mean, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Mary, if I could backtrack on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. caregiving, because Meg and your recommendations you also had um, you also had a recommendation or suggestion that we discard with with kind of verification or fingerprinting for, for caregivers um, I think if there's only one 
caregiver per patient, then I, I, I don't see, I think it's a, just another barrier to the program to have that fingerprinting. Um, also, there's none in adult use. I mean, right. it just seems onerous to, you don't fingerprint a lot of caregivers going to the pharmacy, so yeah. I don't see why you would. Fingerprinting yeah. has just become such a commonplace thing. It just, you know, I mean, geez, every time you leave the country, you end up having to put your palm on, a, uh, on, the, on the little stand for your fingerprints. And for doctors, you know, to see patients in nursing homes or to see patients in hospitals, we've had to start getting fingerprinted, you know, as far back as 10 years. So fingerprinting doesn't seem like a big deal to me. Or if you want a license in a new state, all the states require your fingerprints. But, you know, it's also different. Well, it's different and it's similar. I guess I can see the point because, you know, because I have a, you know, controlled substance license. And so they want to you'd be able to just have all the data that they would need if I were to be prescribing inappropriately. So I would think that that would be the, the, the concept behind getting fingerprints. But if caregivers are, uh, are different from you know, growers and they're just handling the product. You know, I don't have, I certainly don't have a problem removing the fingerprinting issue. I think we yeah. have a hand up again in the, in the room uh, for public comment. So the caregivers, um, the spouse, the mother, um, the sibling who's helping take care of their loved one, um, I think there's going to be some issues with fingerprinting process here in Vermont because um, they're, they're not going to be able to bill individuals um, through the Department of Public Safety, I don't believe, um, because they're, they're billed out for the charge of running the MEGMA to be able to give some information as well. They're billed out for the cost of running the fingerprint supported background check and to set up everybody as yeah. a vendor in the system. So, you right. know, but if you were going to create a different category for these like small businesses that were going to be providing a service, um, that may be something that you guys would consider separately. I think since we, I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, but I think without expanding the number of patients that a caregiver can care for and or grow for, I, I don't see it. Um, I don't think it's reasonable to have you know your spouse or whoever may be your caretaker fingerprinted if it is just that definition that we currently have the one on one. Um, I think you know what you were saying, Dr. Clifton. That is absolutely an aspect of your profession that I think yes you may expect, but when our caregivers come in. And they're just really trying to be there for their loved one or whatever it may be. That uh, fingerprinting process can really seem daunting, um, and we haven't had it up until last year. So unless there were any issues without having it, I don't see a reason to um, keep that. I think it would be a great thing to remove. I mean, in addition to just the hassle and the fear and all of the negative stuff associated with getting fingerprinted, it's just harder and harder to get. I mean. You used to be able to get them at the UPS stores, and now a lot of them have stopped doing that. You have to go to the, you know, to the police station, and then the right police officer has to be available. So I'm with you guys. That's uh, if we can avoid fingerprinting for caregivers, that would be marvelous. I think. Okay. All right. Any other comment? Anything else? I don't want to move us along too quickly. Okay. How about um, how about home grow? Uh, if, if people have had some time to think about, you know, uh, uh, what kind of uh, restrictions we would like to place on home grow. I would say the, the oversight committee had recommended an increase in number of plants, and that's that's where we stand for home grow. No no restriction, just increase. Uh, if somebody's going to do it, they definitely need to be able to have more plants to ensure success. So, um, you know, I mean, it varies across the country. I pulled up that sheet that I created last week, but that was more on possession rather than on, rather than on home grow. But, um, 
I, I, I mean, anywhere from, uh, you know, three flowering and three immature to, you know, uh, six flowering, 12 immature and unlimited seedlings. Um, and I would lean in that direction again, uh, Jim, because of what you said, you've got a three quarter, <laughs> three quarters of one season in Vermont. Coming from Michigan, I understand you have to be like some kind of wizard to be able to have a successful um, garden. And does that seem reasonable for us in Vermont for, for home growth? You know, I'm sure there are people also growing uh, hydroponically and they're doing it indoors. I, I don't I don't know the exact split in the numbers. I can't imagine it's a majority of people doing it. But uh, increasing the number of plants, I think the risk is is low. If you know if the intention of limitation of plants is to a limit the amount that an individual is possessing, whether they're a medical patient or not. You know, as Chairman Pepper pointed out last week, there's no specific uh, limitation of what you have in your home and in your house. But I would argue that if there's a medical patient who's going to process uh, eight or twelve plants after they harvest, I, 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 you know, that's a that's a lot of work, <laughs> and just doing three or four plants lot of work so you know increasing the number of plants it, I would say it's got to be right now it should be doubled from where it is and it could be up to 12 but I don't I don't see even you know a Meg, I, I can't imagine it's really gonna for one patient it's gonna influence that much what their spending is gonna be because there's a unless you're running a professional operation which is what they're not doing a, a it's, it's just not that easy. And you're not ending up with they're finicky plants. And and they're yeah. finicky plants. Well, and then you process it, and if you're making it into an oil or a tincture, it's all a lot of work. So, more of the plant is better to ensure that you end up with something. And, you know, uh, the numbers you recommended again, uh, Mary? Uh, or, uh, uh, we're six uh, mature, 12 immature, and unlimited seedlings. I, and that would, you know, I mean, for somebody who likes to grow, I mean, I don't grow any of my own food. I don't can or any of that. But, I mean, I love to cook, but I certainly am not a grower. <laughs> but, uh, but for people, you know, for my cousins who love to grow, they have massive gardens. So I'm thinking that supporting those who do grow, you know, uh, so that they don't get in again into some sort of restriction or some sort of issue with uh, with legal, you know, that that would that that offering just a very uh, reasonable and generous uh, uh, um, number of plants makes more sense than uh, than heavy duty restrictions. That would, okay, yeah. guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but what what I didn't see in the adult use legislation was discussion of home growth. So, I mean, it's interesting, it's not in there, that there's no kind of guidance. Well, it's, it's there already. I mean, in the, in the existing, you know, statute that was passed, uh, the, the numbers are there, and I, I don't believe that well, those they, get, uh, that those are sunsetted uh, in the newer laws. So, so, do you know the numbers from the the original? I don't want to say exactly because I'll say it. Todd, it's, it's, it's too mature for too mature for immature. Yeah, well, I thought you guys were three and three or two and two. I but I didn't so, have it at my fingertips. Yeah. That's, that's so, adult use. So, right, guys. For so, medical, I believe it's um, no, for two mature and seven uh, mature. Is that right, Lindsay? It's two and seven for patients. Two. Two mature, seven immature. And then Dr. Clifton, you're, you're saying six and 12? Yeah. Okay. All right. I, hey. uh, I, I would say and that limited seedlings. The only concern I have with that is that um, that's a pretty large jump. And so I'm not sure um, you know, where we could go to get this information, but I don't know how comfortable the legislature would be with such an increase. Um, so just my 
two cents. I don't know if anyone has thoughts on that, but. Doctor, are your numbers based on other states? Yeah, I was basing it on uh, Maine. As, and just looking across the country at what would be the most permissive and thinking that Maine is probably doing that. You know, again, thinking about Vermont, not only with the limited duration that grows uh, can be functional in Vermont, but also because of the terrain. And, you know, like uh, Jim was saying, that you can't, you know, you've got the trees yeah. in the backyard, there's a, you know, and thin, and thin soil with rocky bases that, you know, so I was just thinking about ways to make it as, and, and, and because it's such a finicky plant because of the fungal issues and things. Yeah. So we'll, we'll we'll get more numbers and they'll look to be able to Great. that from from Connecticut and some, some other states as well. Great. Thank you. And then Doctor, I'm not sure what I, I had two other things that were contained within Meg's uh, list and they're both more compliance issues, but um, I, I think Meg you were you were talking about the buffer zones. And doing away with that it's more in another subcommittee but that's that's more of a safety a geographic location yeah yeah um so right now we have a 1000 foot right per zone as we're uh, calling it and that is measured as the crow flies so uh, there have been concerns raised by patients in the past that that really um, affects the access because it's very unlikely that we're going to be uh, having medical dispensaries in like a city downtown where there are absolutely going to be schools nearby or places where children congregate. Um, and so my recommendation was that we just reevaluate that distance, maybe reduce it to 500 feet and clarify that it's uh, walking versus at the crow flies. Yeah, and, and, and certainly I don't think there's any debate that the the method of measurement needs to be clarified. Um, and then, you know, you, you can talk about the, di the difference between 500 and 1,000. I'll, I'll just tell you also that in the market structure committee, there's there's discussion of a potential license of limited sale with existing businesses. And that's gonna, you know, obviously it's gonna present some challenges with whatever buffer zone as well. So that, that's gonna be developed, continue to be developed by other committees. Um, the other concern you brought up was the limitation on how many can be served yes. in retail currently, which is three, which again, I, I imagine that's going to be modified um, through adult use and then we can peg it to whatever the adult use. Great. Uh, my one other question um, was that it was my understanding that the uh, oversight, the future medical oversight committee advisory panel um, was to be addressed, and I'm not sure if, if that's yeah. on the agenda. But I, I was, you know, I was going to bring that up as well. I mean, we we are on a timeline right. of, uh, of this cannabis control board having a, a November deadline to notify the legislature. Uh, the the oversight committee's goal has been uh, by the beginning of October to uh, deliver the recommendation to the Cannabis Control Board, and I would understand that it would go through this committee. Um, we are we are far along. We are meeting again uh, next Wednesday, and we'll have a public comment period after that. Uh, there are a few areas left that board members are, are still talking about, but uh, I would think that the, this committee would be able to look at and begin to discuss uh, those recommendations uh, next week and then wait until the public comment is also incorporated uh, at some point in October to make a final uh, consideration <laughs> early in October and, and pass it to, uh, I would imagine, uh, Bryn uh, to for the Cannabis Control Board uh, to consider and the entire advisory board. Do you, any preview, Jim? Are there a couple? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we're we're at the point where I would say, you know, there's there's still uh, uh, some active uh, debate about, uh, for, you know, among the board members as to, uh, you know, who's going to sit on the board. But I would say that the recommendations are 
uh, definitely leaning towards it being very patient and caregiver centric. Um, you know, with the majority of the seats being uh, uh, going to patients, caregivers, and then a smaller amount to uh, medical uh, healthcare practitioners, whether it's a doctor, a naturopath, a nurse practitioner uh, appointed by uh, their appropriate uh, boards. Uh, there's debate right now about uh, including a cultivator uh, on the oversight committee uh, uh, that's split uh, right now. I don't think the discussion's over. And the questions being, uh, you know, I think a lot of the board members feel it's really appropriate, the cultivator being the medicine grower in this case. Uh, uh, at this point in the in the in the uh, growth and life process of, of uh, medical programs all over the country, the cultivator is the person most in touch with the, the medicine. So uh, there's a lot of debate, and, and that hasn't fully been decided yet. And uh, so I, I think that is where we're, you know, where we're headed. Uh, perhaps uh, also including, you know, uh, uh, some administrative temporary uh, board membership, perhaps from the Department of Public Safety as they pass things over to uh, the Cannabis Control Board, but uh, that will be discussed next Wednesday. So uh, that's where we're at, and I can, I can share uh, during this next week the draft document uh, that we're working with uh, for you all to uh, consider and uh, take a look at, and we should be finished up with it, uh, I would say, within 10 days. Thanks, that'd be great. And I, I do want to make sure we, we get some ample time for public comment. But I, I just want to remind everyone, again, what, one of the priorities uh, that I had when we were starting was to ensure the supply chain. What we discussed was forming that kind of baseline layer for products in each of the retail. And I think we're going to start to reach out to some of the, the dispensaries. Um, if we could continue along and maybe even have one of them uh, one of these meetings so we can develop that. Um, you know, that's going to be a part of our, our recommendation to the board. Okay, um, so I, I do want to make sure uh, the folks in the room, if, if there's any other public comment, Dr. Clifton, did you have any, any other closing? No, I was just okay. thinking, I was actually thinking about uh, how politicized mammograms have become and how uh, you know, mammograms are covered by every insurance company because breast cancer is such a highly political thing. And I wonder if we should just put some comment in here that insurance companies should be required to pay for medicinal cannabis or that we would strongly encourage them to do so in the state of Vermont and just, you know, start to open that discussion with uh, with insurance companies. When we have people who are relying on it for the medicine and if we have people who can't home grow and then they find themselves, you know, really trapped. Um, I think that would be really great wording to put in here somehow. Or, or in a separate memo, but yeah, that, that's something we can definitely discuss next, next meeting. Um, Brynis, does anyone have public comments? Yep, we do have a couple of people who'd like to give a public comment. Thank you. Meg is what's best for her profit dispensary. I, I hear very little talk about what is best for the patients. I hear this criticism of the Maine program, uh, but in the meantime, I, I wonder how are Maine patients being cared for? I'm going to guess pretty well. Um, and if a caregiver means uh, switching the definition of a caregiver to a parent or guardian, uh, so what does that mean for the, the patient? There, it feels like it's all being so the patient is forced to go to the dispensary to get their product, and that's just not what's best for the patients. Um, also, this the marijuana for symptom relief oversight committee um, that Jim is the chair of. I uh, I've been sitting on those meetings uh, for quite some time, and it seems that they want to change the uh, definition. Um, especially uh, Amy Klingler and, and Dr. Joe seem to really want to change 
the definition of what a caregiver means to a parent or guardian because uh, by, the law, by the way the law is written, there has to be a certain amount of seats dedicated to uh, caregivers. So it seems convenient. Let's change the definition of caregiver and now, uh, then now, now, now growers don't get a seat. You know, it's just like, it happens just like that. Um, and the point is not, you know, the point of this whole medical program is to give the patients the best care possible. But all it feels like is, is the point is just to prop up Meg's dispensary. Um, it, it's the, the point is to give uh, the patients the highest quality product. That's, that's the whole point of this. And, uh, and growers have been here uh, all along growing this, uh, in many cases, amazing product for, uh, for their patients. And, uh, you know, I bet if you, if you were to actually talk to many patients, you would see all the time that, that they love the relationship with their personal grower because a dispensary is going to sell flour that is best for their bottom line, not what's best for the patient, just it's bottom line. Uh, so uh, that, that's kind of all, I, all I'm, I'm going to say right now about that. Um, but, um, you know, it, but just my main point that, that, uh, that growers need to have a seat here. They're the ones who know about the plant. Um, there, there's, on all these boards I sit in, it's amazing how little knowledge there is about the actual plant itself and what it's like to grow. Uh, I, I think for that reason alone, you need to have a, a grower on these, on these boards, you know? Um, and so, but just to move on to a, a whole different subject, um, there's also a crippling vape tax uh, in the state of Vermont. It's 92% uh, vape tax. It started off uh, as, uh, the intentions were great. The intentions were to uh, stop the problem with Juul nicotine products in high schools. And I think everybody can agree that it is an awful problem and it needs to be solved. But what the legislature did is use language that was so broad that it affects uh, every single thing, every single product that has the word vape in it. And so there's literally products that are arguably the best, most, the healthiest way to consume cannabis. And the, the, many of these companies won't even sell to Vermont anymore. Uh, the 92% tax essentially just killed the whole, the whole program. Um, and, it, and you know, so again, just bringing it back to patients, because that's what the medical program is about. I think we can all agree with that. I think it needs to come back to that and, uh, and, 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 uh, and make that the point, not just insulating the current dispensary and its profits from, uh, from a more expansive medical program. Thank you. Do you want to identify yourself? Sorry, um, I'm, uh, my name's Adam Gross. Everyone calls me Tito. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam, for that input. Thank you. I, I agree that, especially in the subcommittee, we have to stay super patient focused. Thank you. Thanks. Bryn, we had uh, another public comment? Yep. This guy. <laughs> All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Pizzatello, uh, Vermont Growers Association, um, Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition. Um, I'm also a state registered uh, caregiver in our Vermont Marijuana Registry. I have been since the first year it's been operational, 2006-2007. Uh, um, thank you uh, for this conversation. Uh, uh, I'm heartened to hear you guys address um, home grow uh, and also um, possession limits. I want to actually just stop for a moment and just uh, bring up two points of clarity. Um, so our organization tracks some of the national trends across the, uh, in each state. Um, and I just want to say that uh, the average, uh, national average for uh, home grow, the plant count, is 6.5 to 7. So that's the average nationally across all of the states. We've been fixed at two mature plants for about two decades now. Uh, so just some context to keep you guys aware of that. Also, a second point of clarity before I move on to my comment. Um, caregiver allowances, uh, heartened to hear you guys talk about that. That's something that we support. I appreciate you guys getting ahead of that. Uh, the caregiver allowances that was stated uh, have been identified as 1 through 15. That's not true. There are a couple states that have unlimited caregiver allowances. So please consider that. Hawaii is one of them. Uh, I just want to be uh, clear and accurate with, with some of those points that you guys had raised earlier. Uh, and I wanted to bring that up. Um, I do want to say, uh, you know, just stepping back and reminding ourselves, and Tom, you, you just did this a moment ago, about what we're doing here and the purpose of this subcommittee. 
Uh, we're here to address uh, the objectives that were outlined where not just continuity of services and products and ensuring them to the current customer base or patient base, but really addressing the other issues that are in the current uh, medical program, which are affordability and access. Affordability and access. I cannot urge you guys enough to avoid bifurcating our medical program and its licensing. Uh, that would further complicate this program. Uh, these are unique, sensitive individuals, Vermonters, who are sick, who try to engage this program. It, it should not be without red tape or um, you know, uh, appropriate regulation. But we should not be, and I urge you strongly, to avoid creating further layers of bureaucracy uh, and licensing that an individual needs to navigate to provide medication to patients. That is a game stopper for those that wish to participate in this program. Uh, we are urging, uh, and you guys will see this in our language, a five uh, patient allowance, for, or five caregiver allowance for each patient, and a increase of 10 mature plants disregarding immature plants. These numbers come from Maine uh, and a couple other uh, states that have similar uh, 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 plant counts uh, and regulations in their medical program. So we are asking you guys to adopt something that's already proven successful in other states. Um, and so thank you, um, and uh, I'll just leave it at that. Appreciate it. Can you, can you repeat your name? I'm sorry. Pardon me? Tom. Tom? My name is Jeff, Jeffrey Pizzatello from the Vermont Growers Association, sure, and the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition. Thanks. Vermont Growers Association and the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition? Yes. Thank Th you. Thank you. Brynn, do we have any other nope. public comments? Nope, that's it. Okay, thank you. I know we're out of time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move to adjourn unless anyone has anything else before Monday's meeting. I can second that. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the public comments.